This is downtown Kitwe. Kitwe is a city in what was then northern Rhodesia. This picture was taken in 1955. Now it's the second biggest city in Zambia. When I first saw this image with my Canadian eyes, this reminded me of pictures of Canadian cities from around the same time, especially smaller Canadian industrial cities. This really could have been Hamilton or Whitby in 1955. I also think there's a, a strange kind of permanence to this image, like it's always, look, like it's always looked like this. Um, but just 20 or 30 years before this photo was taken, the landscape that you see here was completely rural. And the story behind that rapid transformation is that copper was discovered in this area in the 1920s and an urban industrial economy uh, quickly sprang up around it. And this came to be known as the African Industrial Revolution. So a few thoughts on this just to get started. This was described at the time as modernity and progress coming to this part of the African continent. And it was assumed that this progress would just keep going forward in a straight line indefinitely because that's natural. But history, anthropology will show you, history does not just move forward in a straight line. And the way things play out through time isn't necessarily progress. You know, the idea of progress also implies a value judgment. If we call change progress, then we're basically saying that that change was a good thing or even, you know, the way it was supposed to be. But who is the we in that, you know, formulation and uh, who gets to decide what was good change and what was bad change? They're all questions that anthropologists grapple with when looking at the history of places like the one on the screen, Kitwe, the second biggest city in Zambia, and this is that city in 1955. That city is in Copper Belt Province, Zambia, a part of that country that is named after the main resource that gets extracted from it. There's been a lot of important anthropology done there. Um, that anthropology looked at how ordinary people's lives were transformed by industrialization and urbanization since large-scale copper mining began in that area. And the bigger picture is colonialism and social change, which is, of course, the title of this episode. I'm going to start by outlining what the Zambian Copper Belt is and how it came to be. I'll get into more detail on this idea of the African Industrial Revolution. I'll say a bit more about what everyday life was like for ordinary people in these mining towns, and I'll talk about what all of this meant for anthropology and how it shifted our understandings as anthropologists of how people fit into their society and also what modernity means. So just to be clear about where I'm talking about for anybody who's not familiar with this part of the world, this is Zambia on a world map, and this is the Copper Belt province in relation to the rest of Zambia and its surroundings. I'm going to start with the European colonization of this part of the continent because the theme of the episode is colonialism and social change. That story begins uh, with a period from 1881 to 1914 that historians call the Scramble for Africa. So to start with some context, the west coast of the African continent, by comparison, had been a key part of the global trade system going back to the 1500s. It was one of the points on the triangular slave trade. So that's the west coast, but in the late 1800s, the interior of the continent was still relatively isolated by comparison. European powers had been taking colonies on the African continent by this point, but by the 1870s, only 10% of the continent was under direct European colonial control, and by 1914, that was up to 90%. The story behind these numbers is, by about the mid-19th century, European explorers and missionaries had begun mapping the interior of Africa, and in the process, they realized there was fortunes to be made from raw materials there. This was the peak of the European so-called Industrial Revolution, and the factories in Europe needed metal and other materials, and they also needed new markets. So the plan was to take raw materials out of the interior of Africa, uh, turn them into consumer goods, and then sell them, including selling them back to the people in the interior of Africa. There was a lot of wealth at stake in this scheme, and so it led to some very bitter, bitter rivalries between the main European powers at that time. So in 1884, uh, the German head of state, the Chancellor Otto von Bismarck, came up with a, what he hoped was a solution to this problem. He, he called a meeting of the other European leaders in Berlin, and the purpose was basically to come up with the rules for colonizing Africa as far as Europe was concerned, I guess. So these European leaders would decide amongst themselves 
who was allowed to conquer which part of the African continent. And ideally, by coming to these agreements, that would prevent war and conflict among them. Not one African person was invited. There was not one representative of any nation or state in Africa. Um, nobody from Africa had, had, had the slightest say in what was decided. So these European leaders drew these national boundaries basically across the map of Africa according to their own priorities. And if you look at a map of the continent today, most of the lines you see between countries are based on the boundaries that were drawn in the 30 years or so after that conference that was held in, in Berlin in 1884 through uh, lines drawn through treaties and other agreements uh, among European powers. Now, when they partitioned land at that conference, it wasn't guaranteed that the European power would get its hands on the land that it was you know allotted it just meant that they could try to do it and other europeans wouldn't interfere with them it was then up to the powers then themselves to try to conquer that land and uh the example that i'll zoom in on is the process that led to the creation of the nation state of zambia um one of the areas that great britain was you know allowed to colonize as far as uh, the rest of europe was concerned was an area that came to be known as northern rhodesia and this land was conquered by Cecil Rhodes's British South Africa Company in the 1890s. The British South Africa Company was an example of a, of a private company that had its own police force, which suppressed the local population and took land for European settlers. This is Cecil Rhodes. It's a cartoon. He's standing over the African continent. He has his right foot planted on Cape Town, South Africa, and his left foot planted on Cairo, Egypt, and this is a reference to a plan that he had to build a telegraph line from Cape Town to Cairo. This was a cartoon in a humor magazine called Punch. So it's actually making fun of Cecil Rhodes and his, you know, huge ambitions. But this cartoon shows up in a lot of history textbooks as a kind of sign of the times. And for years after this, cartoonists would create different versions of this image to make fun of other politicians. So anytime a politician made some ridiculous promise they probably couldn't keep or was acting especially arrogant or something, they would have them recreate this image of Cecil with, you know, arms and legs spread wide, looking triumphant. This was something like an internet meme, but in, you know, newspaper cartoons beginning in the 1890s. Anyway, this image was making fun of Cecil Rhodes, but he was also a very powerful and a very, and a very respected figure, um, and, and still is. He's the namesake of the Rhodes Scholarship, which is still one of the most prestigious academic worlds worldwide, even though um, statues of him are some of the statues that have been targeted by recent protest movements to remove statues of uh, influential colonizers and racists from uh, years gone by. But back to the history, in the decades after Cecil Rhodes' company took that land, the land was then transformed into an urban society, one that was, uh, you know, in today's words, multicultural, but also very segregated. So this new society was created through mass movements of Europeans, mainly from the British-controlled uh, Union of South Africa from, to the south of this region, uh, them as well as the mass movement of people from many different African ethnic groups into the, the new mining towns that were set up around where copper was discovered. So by the end of 1930, there were 30,000 people working in the mines. Uh, commerce followed them, and local trade flourished in these boom years. And then the Great Depression hit. And by 1932, the mining workforce was down to about 7,500, down from, from 30,000. And in particular, many Europeans had left. Um, things started to rebound by the mid-30s, and then it was boom times again during and after World War II. And uh, since then, the kind of boom and bust cycle has, has continued. And next episode, I'll follow up on some more recent anthropology on what that looked like in the 1980s in this part of the continent. So in the midst of all of that, uh, in the mid-20th century, across the African continent, there was a wave of uprisings and revolutions, and as part of that, Northern Rhodesia became the independent state of Zambia in 1964. In the case of Zambian independence, Northern Rhodesia had been part of a, of a colonial structure called the Central African Federation a bit before this, from 1953 to 1963. That federation was dissolved in 63. Uh, Northern Rhodesia became Zambia, and the other parts of the federation later became Malawi and Zimbabwe. Um, by that time, it was often said that Africa was, quote, emerging into the global economy as if it hadn't already been a part of the global economy, and that it was modernizing. Lots of scare quotes in this episode. Now, just to summarize the story so far, when this land was colonized in the 1890s, it was completely rural. 
By 1969, the population was 30% urban, and nearly a quarter of the country of Zambia was uh, working officially, you know, earning on the books wages, and Zambia was one of the richest of these new African states. And as early as the 1940s, it was said that Africa was having its own industrial revolution, and along with that, it was being urbanized. Now, the series is about anthropology, so I'll move on to what anthropology was doing there. And uh, for that, I'm going to begin with some observations from James Ferguson's book, Expectations of Modernity, from 1999, so way, way after this era I'm talking about. But Ferguson was an anthropologist who did field work in Zambia, you know, much later, as I said, in the 1980s. But the intro to this book summarizes what anthropologists had done in this part of the African continent before him, and there's some pretty useful observations here. So he begins with this kind of... Uh, you know, snide observation, I guess, that uh, anthropology, at least old anthropology, likes to study particular topics in particular places. So places kind of get typecast as the place where you go to study a key topic. Um, for example, when people want to study hierarchy, they like to go to India to study the caste system. Um, when they want to study systems of exchange, they want to go to places like the Trobrian Islands. Um, if people are studying, you know, gender expression, they'll study drag communities, for example. Um, and for a while, when anthropologists decided it was time to study social change and urbanization, the place to do that was the Zambian Copper Belt. So it kind of became fixed as, as or typecast as the place where you study urbanization. I should also make sure this is clear. Ferguson made that point to criticize anthropology, and that's also why I'm repeating his point. Uh, he was saying it's a bad thing that anthropology tended to go to particular places to look for a certain thing. Um, every place is complex. Every place has lots going on. There's no need to only study a place for one particular reason, but it's part of the uncomfortable history of anthropology that this series kind of starts off with, and then we get into more modern stuff. So going back to the days of the original Copper Belt ethnography, at that time, structural functionalism was still kind of the dominant theory in anthropology. Um, I talked about this last episode just to review a little bit. It's the theory that society is made up of several important structures, and each one has its own function, you know, like I said last time, that's where we get this catchy name of structural functionalism for, from. It's all about the structure and the function. Um, the structures are kind of like vital organs in a human or an animal's body. So in the case of a human or an animal's body, you have organs like heart, brain, lungs, etc. They all fulfill their own function, and that function contributes to the functioning of, of the whole uh, organism. Um, in the case of a human society, you have structures like religion, like the economy, like you know the family structure. They all fulfill their own function, and each one contributes to the functioning of the whole. Often the interest was in seeing how these things functioned in so-called primitive societies. And like I said last episode, we no longer think of any place as primitive. All societies are equally complex in their own way. Uh, some are just, you know, bigger than others, I guess. But anyway, that's kind of my nutshell review of structural functionalism to get the whole story, or at least, you know, more of the story, the whole part of the story that I care about. That's in the last episode, episode two of Ethnography and Culture. But actually, I changed my mind. There is a little bit more of that story that I want to repeat, uh, just a little bit. It's also important. It's about how anthropologists did research. Um, a key figure associated with that old school, the structural functionalists, was Branislav Malinowski, as I talked about last episode. He's often credited with bringing anthropology off the veranda, which was the title of last episode. The first anthropologist, just to review, would stay in their offices and read the reports of missionaries and colonial officials. Those were the armchair anthropologists. The next step were the veranda anthropologists. They would at least go to the places they were studying, but they wouldn't actually speak to people there. They would just sit on a veranda of a colonial building and watch. Uh, Malinowski said, that's not good enough either. You have to learn their language, take part in their everyday life, including the boring parts. And his way of doing that was through participant observation fieldwork and due in large part to his success with that method. Participant observation fieldwork became the new norm in anthropology. It became what you had to do to be taken seriously as an anthropologist. Malinowski's best known publication, Argonauts of the Western Pacific from 1922, that was based on fieldwork that he had done in the Trobrian Islands of Papua New Guinea. Uh, but that same approach that he used there was then taken to studies across Africa as well, where it took the form of the so-called 
tribe study. Now we get into some of the problems with structural functionalism, despite its other advancements and Malinowski's kind of innovation of, of modern field work. Um, structural functionalist theory was really bad at understanding how societies change and how they're complex because they didn't just see society as being made up of different parts that all work together for the needs of the whole. They also seemed to assume that everything had uh, always been working that way and always would be working that way because they didn't say much about history and social change. Now, when applied to studies done in Africa, this often, as I said, took the form of the tribe study, which meant studying groups of people as if they were isolated and as if their you know, culture was kind of simple and cohesive and then unified them into these completely distinct and separate groups living in a self-sufficient system with really no meaningful connection or, or, or influence from anything around them. Before I go on, a little sidebar on uh, the concept of the tribe. It's a complicated word. Um, I don't use it myself. Neither do, I think, most anthropologists now. Um, but up until, I guess, the 60s or the 70s, it was a widely accepted way of describing groups of people. Um, it usually means kind of the same thing as what we now describe as ethnic groups. Um, an ethnic group is defined by ethnicity. A quick definition of ethnicity, that's a sense of shared historical or cultural and or ancestral connection to a, a group of people that you, that you live in. Um, I think this is the most neutral concept we currently have to describe those kind of connections. And uh, tribe is one old way of describing something similar. But, you know, the problem with the tribe concept is that it was never used to describe, for example, white Europeans. Um, you know, there was, there was never an English tribe or a German tribe, but there was always, you know, a, an, an Iroquois tribe or a Zulu tribe, for example. So in that way, the concept of the tribe is part of this kind of Eurocentric discourse that portrays non-Western peoples as, as small and bounded and isolated and, uh, as I said, simple. This happened to fit quite well within structural functionalist theory, which liked to reduce culture to kind of functions and, and, and rules and, and patterns, I guess. But the idea of the tribe also predates structural functionalism. The concept of the tribe started to be seriously questioned and rejected by about the 60s or the 70s. Um, by the early 2000s decade, when I was in university, I was taught to use the term ethnic group instead of, of tribe. Um, but at the same time, I'm well aware that many people... Um, you know, in, in the real world, outside of academia, people of many African ethnicities still describe their own groups as tribes. And, you know, it's not my business to tell people how to describe their own ethnic group or their own culture. But, you know, in, in academia anyway, uh, most African scholars have kind of rejected the idea of the tribe. Anthropology doesn't really use it anymore. And those anthropologists who still do use it, I think, should probably stop. So I guess kind of a disclaimer on that note. If I do say the word tribe in this video, it's because I'm quoting old sources um, that were published in the days when tribe was still the word you used in academia. Anyway, around the time this urbanization began in the Copper Belt, uh, the new kind of hot topic in anthropology was cultural contact, how so-called tribes were being influenced by so-called Western civilization, apparently for the first time. And because of Eurocentrism, it was presumed that the fact that these tribes were being touched by Western culture for the first time, that that was a good thing for them. It's what they needed to progress. Um, but at the same time, these were very harshly segregated societies. So when these new um, you know, labor towns set up around the mines, you had African and European settlers living and working separately from each other with Africans disadvantaged in every way. Um, so the idea that these bounded cultures were now being influenced by Western civilization for their own good started to look pretty ridiculous. Anyway, I'll show you some images of Copper Belt life during these early boom years. So this is a map of Luantia, another town on the Copper Belt. And again, these were segregated places. Africans and Europeans living in separate townships. Uh, the main mine here is flanked by two residential areas, one with about 3,000 Europeans living in bungalows with a hospital, a school, a, a mine club, and, and recreation grounds, and the other residential area with about 30,000 Africans living in small one- and two-roomed houses built by the mining company. Uh, the African district also had its own school, hospital, bar, and, and more. And apparently there was a small kind of elite in the African quarters who had housing that was close in quality to the Europeans' housing. 
And here's an old image of a miner and his family at home. And here's an image of some European settlers. Uh, most settlers left, but a few years ago I found an online community where uh, older settlers and, and their descendants kind of reunite online. And on, on their website, I found this image of a brownie troop. So kind of recreating British domestic life in South Central Africa. And here's an overhead image of a copper belt town during the boom years. Okay, and now back to anthropology again. So in 1937, the colonial government established an institute for social research in its Central African territories, and they called it the Rhodes Livingstone Institute. It was named after Cecil Rhodes, who was the head of the private army that conquered the territory, who I mentioned earlier, um, the guy who had the funny cartoon made of him, uh, and David Livingstone, who was credited as the first European to explore that land. So one of the missions of this research institute named after these two figures, was to study the effects of European influence on African culture uh, based on who it was named after and who set it up. It probably sounds like it would be a very pro-colonial and thus racist organization, and in some ways it was, but perhaps ironically, most people associated with this institute actually hated racism and saw themselves as allies or defenders of Africans. Uh, their approach it was also very important in terms of the history of anthropology. So in the next few minutes, I'll share some highlights of some of the work of the Rhodes Livingstone Institute affiliated anthropologist. Um, I'll talk about some critiques of their work, and then I'll talk about a, bit, a couple of highlights of some more recent anthropology about the Copper Belt, but I'll save most of that for the next episode. It's all part of an approach that came to be known as political anthropology, so the study of relations of power either in society as a whole or in a particular setting in that society, and also the power involved in how that local setting you know, relates to other local settings and the broader structures that all these places are found in. So this next piece is about the Manchester School, and the story kind of blends in with the story of the Rose Livingstone Institute because there was a lot of overlap in the key personnel between these two uh, institutions, but they weren't the same thing. Anyway, the Manchester School began in the late 1940s with the appointment of Max Gluckman, who had been uh, the second director of the Rose Livingstone Institute. So he was appointed to Manchester and then built the Department of Anthropology. Um, those affiliated with that school did some really innovative work. Um, mainly they broke from the structural functionalists. So they didn't just focus on um, groups that they thought were isolated or rural or, or so-called tribal communities. They were also interested in new urban developments occurring worldwide, including in the Zambi in the Zambian Copper Belt, uh, especially after World War II, urbanization exploded worldwide. And these anthropologists wanted to know what happens as people, ideas, cultures, institutions, values, uh, forms of affiliation, when all of that moves from small-scale societies to cities, you know, what, what happens to all of that? That was their main question. And the answer is, in short, it's very complicated. So older generations of anthropology would have seen this as, uh, you know, progress and civilization finally coming to this part of Central Africa. And some anthropologists in that day did, you know, see things that way um others talked about cultural breakdown it was as if that you know by going to work in a mine or live in a city that somebody from a so-called tribal population would in the process like lose their culture and lose themselves and the manchester school moved beyond these these two kind of uh you know very inadequate and and, and simplified views um instead they were interested in part in what was new about this situation you know industrial cities in central africa um but also they, they were looking at the new kinds of social ties and the ways of belonging that came with that move into the city. They were looking at how rural and urban places could be very different from each other in important ways, but also still, you know, two parts of the same overall system. So there's old and there's new, but again, change doesn't just mean that the old is completely replaced by the new. Traces of the old show up in the new and in turn, you know, the old survives, but new things reshape how those old things are, are expressed. Uh, in other words, it's a dialectical relationship. It's old and new kind of influencing each other in this, this constant feedback loop. Um, the Manchester School anthropologists saw that so-called tribes are not these isolated little groups with firm boundaries around them. Um, and they weren't just changing to fit in with the times. 
when they moved to cities. They were exercising agency, so they were following opportunities. They were making choices that made sense for them in the moment. Uh, some parts of their old life ways stayed the same. Other parts changed. The whole thing was complicated and unpredictable. So in other words, it was possible to be a part of a so-called tribe, but also be an industrial worker who lived in a city. And a kind of pithy quote from Gluckman that sums up a lot of that. He once wrote, an African townsman is a townsman and an African miner is a miner. Their attention to detail was also kind of a new thing. Um, instead of trying to tell the whole truth about a whole culture in one book, the way Malinowski tried to, um, those in the Manchester School did these very detailed and rich descriptions of, of particular locales and particular situations. So that complex interplay between the old and the new aspects of culture, how does that show up in moments like when miners go on strike or when people boycott a business in their town? or do a traditional dance that makes fun of other ethnic groups who live in the same city as them. Um, as my mentor, Malcolm Blinko, put it to me once, those, those, those these key moments, they're like pressure points in the social system, which can show you both the alignments and the fractures in that system, these kind of key moments that shows you what holds people together, but also would, what, what also could potentially kind of shatter everything if it goes wrong, I guess. Um, so what else can I say about the Manchester School? They did continue to use that word tribe, so it does show up in the articles and books that I'm talking about um, because that was the vocabulary of, of the day. But they were not talking about tribes as these kind of isolated and bounded little unique systems the way other anthropologists had in the past. Um, instead, those, those tribal identities, those affiliations, um, those were just one of the many kinds of identities that people lived through at the same time as other ones. Now the personal and the political were also important parts of, of the research agenda, um, as they are when anybody does research, I feel. In this case, I think it goes a long way to explain their interest in, in social change and complexity. So that the second director of the Rose Livingstone Institute, who later founded the Manchester School, Max Gluckman, um, he was a South African Jew who was staunchly opposed to apartheid. Um, some of those in the Manchester School were, were members of the Communist Party of Great Britain. Um, all of them were influenced by Marxist theory to at least some extent. And uh, sometimes they got in trouble for all of that. I mean, they, they were working, when they worked for the, the Rhodes Livingstone Institute, they were working for an organization that was set up by a colonial government, um, you know, to study the effects of colonialism on local cultures. And, uh, you know, a lot of times they were biting the hand that fed, basically. Uh, Gluckman was once banned from entering northern Rhodesia. Another key uh, thinker affiliated with, with this institute was, was Epstein. He was once prevented from going to the mine township when studying unionization in, in Luantia, for example. Um, complicated, uh, you know, controversial, very politically involved scholars. Um, at times, they were also criticized from kind of the other side for having, uh, I guess, a simplistic view of the local population, especially of, of the European settlers. Uh, some accused them of even hating the settlers. There was talk that one of them once got in a bar fight with a settler who had uh, made racist remarks. Um, one of the few women among the Rhodes Livingstone Institute once accused them, uh, you know, basically for being a bunch of wannabe kind of macho tough guys, I guess, uh, kind of fighting on behalf of Africans, like appointing themselves as the defenders of Africans, but not engaging seriously with, with African scholars and intellectuals. Some of the criticism of the Rhodes Livingstone Institute anthropologist was indeed, uh, quite harsh. So, for example, Bernard Magubane, a South African scholar, um, said that in 1971 that they had basically been serving the colonial system by taking it for granted and studying how Africans were adapting to it. So despite all this emphasis on, you know, complexity and uh, the old and the new kind of reforming each other, they were still just sort of taking it for granted that Europe came and imposed this thing and Africans had to adapt to it. Um, and, you know, others said they were working with this, they were still working with the same kind of grand narrative of tribal populations adapting to modernity, even at the same time as trying to complicate that narrative, I guess. Um, but even if all of that was the case, it was still a big step in their day, in the day of the Rhodes Livingstone Institute anthropologists, to even say that African ethnic groups could change and indeed were changing because more overtly racist and conservative commentators at that time argued that because the workers were just so-called tribesmen, 
then they didn't really need a decent living or decent working conditions because they were used to far worse. There are no heroes in this, you know, story of the, the history of anthropological theory and, and methods. It's just, you know, scholars working with what they had to work with in their time, ideally pushing the conversation forward in, 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 in new directions, um, improving on problems with, with the past, and that's what the RLI anthropologists, um, I think, we're trying to do. Anyway, I'll, 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 I'm going to look at a bit more closely at a couple of key works from that, that era of anthropology. Uh, one of them is Gluckman's Anthropological Problems Arising from the African Industrial Revolution, which summarizes about 20 years of research on urban and rural communities in the area. Um, early in the piece, he outlines two principles for research in places like this. The first one is that researchers must throw out their preconceptions and directly observe life in a particular situation. So there's nothing new there. That's field work that's, that's been established. Um, the other point I think is pretty new. It's the idea that a copper belt town, um, to quote directly from, from, from Gluckman, it's, it's a system, though not of course a perfect system, with a closed repetitive pattern, which, which is a new insight, as I said, because the structural functionalists before him would have said that, uh, you know, a copper belt town does indeed have a closed repetitive system. Gluckman found that tribal identities overlap with other ones like religious and political and, and social identities, and that people keep those tribal identifications, but they get modified in the new context and in turn also shape the new context because that's what makes sense for them in the moment. It's not because they're they're backward or conservative. Another key piece is an article called Politics in an Urban African Community by Epstein. Epstein found that uh, during the growth of a copper belt town, as he put it, typical urban associations and industrial groupings ousted European attempts to work with authorities based on tribal affiliations. So there were three main so-called tribal groups in the Copper Belt mine towns. There, there were Bemba, Barazzi, and, and Nyasa Landers. And it was the Bemba generally who got the positions of authority. Um, to put it bluntly, the Europeans in charge of the mines liked the tribal political systems because they thought it would help them kind of keep things functioning smoothly in their favor. So as part of this, they put tribal elders in a position that I guess you could kind of uh, summarize as, as like middle management. But as it turned out, once they moved into cities, Central Africans did exactly what European workers had done when their lives had been urbanized and industrialized. They developed class identities, they formed trade unions, which they, you know, identified with and that was important to them at the same time as they kept their older tribal identities. And I'll read you a quote from Epstein that summarizes this quite well, I think. Uh, he wrote, fundamental to the urban situation is the fact that Africans of many tribes now participate in the common wage economy of the towns. They are linked and divided within new sets of relations which involve them as wage earners and urban dwellers rather than as tribesmen. And again, this is what people do everywhere when they become urbanized. So for example, Gluckman compared the situation to that of uh, you know towns in the UK, I guess to kind of drive the point home to his largely British audience. He said there's also so-called tribalism in British towns too. It's just not recognized as such. So in an average you know English industrial city, you have groups of, of Scottish, Welsh, Irish, uh, Jewish people, for example, those ethnic groups have their own associations, um, in some cases their own neighborhoods, but they also sometimes unite with one another in political parties or trade unions, for example. So, you know, these o overlapping kind of ethnic slash tribal identities and uh, class or political identities, they, they, they happen at the same time. And uh, to think that it would have been any different in Africa is uh, misinformed and basically it was just a racist assumption that, you know, African populations are somehow simpler, I guess. Um, so, for example, there were strikes in, in the Zambian uh, copper belt towns, labor strikes that turned violent through the 1930s, um, much like there also was across the rest of the industrialized world. And during those strikes, the tribal elders at times had to be protected from workers in revolt. Uh, but after the strikes, the elders returned to their traditional roles as being, you know, sort of something like management and were respected at least a little. Then in 1940, there was another strike in which some miners were shot. And at this point, the tribal elder system was rejected outright. So then the British government sent out union organizers from England to go help Africans 
organize unions, which is interesting because a union is supposed to be like a power block that workers form and use to fight against management. But in this case, in some sense, you have management, you know, helping the workers form a union. Um, but, you know, sometimes unions everywhere have been turned into things that just sort of advocate for workers at a surface level while also helping to kind of keep the peace in the workplace, which ultimately, I think, serves the interest of those in charge more than, than, than the workers. Um, anyway, under this newly trained union leadership, the, the African Workers Union voted to abolish the elder system, but then similar conflicts continued in, in, in the decades ahead. Another key study was the Kalila Dance uh, by Mitchell, another one of these anthropologists from this era. Um, that one, I guess, is a more classically anthropological study in that it's about a very specific kind of cultural uh, you know, performance. It's about a dance competition, basically, in the Copper Belt, where groups would put on performances that made fun of other groups, and the humor apparently was quite dirty at times, but the group being made fun of would be there kind of laughing along with everybody else. So sounds like it was all in good fun. Um, but one thing Mitchell noticed that's the most anthropologically, I guess, interesting part of this, this story was that the dancers in these productions gave themselves these, these formal titles and ranks that were borrowed from the British elite. And they kind of worked that into their, their dance performances, satirizing, you know, the, the place they lived in and other ethnic groups around them. Um, so Mitchell took this as a sign that people were aspiring to move up the, the class system, even while rejecting European domination at the same time. And Gluckman looked at this study and said it was yet another example of how there is, in his words, some kind of working integrated social system in the Copper Belt towns, but that also it, quote, must not be thought of as rigid, tight, closed, or self-consistent. That's as far as I'll take the story for now, but I'll continue parts of it in parts of next week's video. Uh, just as a preview, I'm going to come back to one of the much newer ethnographies that I mentioned uh, close to the beginning, James Ferguson's Expectations of Modernity, uh, published in 1999 and based on research he did in the Copper Belt in the 1980s. Um, in that, he described how people had been living with that constant boom and bust cycle of the extraction economy that had been you know raging since the days that i just described uh which I, I should be clear that's not a zambian problem that's that's common in any place that depends so heavily on on resource extraction so with that i'll come back to what i said at the start of this episode about how all of this you know complicates how people on the copper belt and many of the rest of us have been taught to see modernity and progress and our place in it and uh you know the idea that everything moves in a straight line and development just keeps on making life better and better as time goes on um it's not that simple and next week we'll look at some more ethnographies that take up that idea in uh you know times closer to our own 